Well, you may be seated and, and good morning. Um, you can turn with me into in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And uh, it's a joy to be with you this morning. My name is Brian. I think I know most of you. Uh, but it's a joy to be able to bring God's Word with uh, to you today. Uh, alongside Drew, I get the opportunity to teach and be pastor here at Bedrock. Uh, and I do want to say Happy New Year. Uh, 2023 is almost over. We are at the edge of 2024. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know how, how this past year was for you, but it's always a mile marker for me to pause into the new year, to, to, to reflect, to think about, man, what's it look like and to anticipate what's to come, uh, to look forward to, even though, you know, um, yeah, just look forward to what's next. Um, but appreciate what, what God has done in, in, in my life and in this church in the, the past year. And I'm excited for what's next in our study in the book of Hebrews, as Drew mentioned. I really think uh, that theme of, of the, the series is running with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And uh, it's uh, just like uh, being able to spend New Year's together with you uh, this morning is, is sweet. I think it's, it's special to think about uh, that I get a run with my eyes fixed on Jesus with each of you uh, that have come to be such dear friends, brothers and sisters. And so I'm excited about what God has for us in that. As always, we'll, we'll move verse by verse throughout the entire book and work our way through. And, and would you be praying that God uses that? Um, and then this Rhythms of the Faith series, uh, if you think about, as you reflect on the past year, 2023, man, what are those rhythms in your life? Maybe it's uh, you walk the dog every day at a certain time, or you meet up with a certain person every week. Um, there's habits that, that you've formed in, in exercise. And so I'm excited to be able to look at our life and say, man, what's our, our spiritual habits? What are, what's the ways in which we're practicing out and, and, and taking in these spiritual disciplines that, that God has given us? So just to start kind of with this topic this morning, I think it's helpful to think about um, this idea that we move from a knowledge of something to an experience. That uh, for us, the moments in life where we can cannot just know something in our minds, but we can actually step into an experience that, uh, for example, we might read about a historic landmark. We might read about uh, some of the places you can go in Washington, D.C., but there's something about taking that knowledge and, and those facts out of a history book and being able to go and walk uh, Washington, D.C. and to, to be able to experience the monuments, to step on um, the floor, to, to read and to, to experience what it's like to be in that place. Or maybe studying for a career that, that you're going to be part of. Maybe you're going to be a doctor or a teacher. There's something about all the, the head knowledge of that. But man, when we're in a practicum or when we step into uh, the operating room and we experience truly what it's like to take that knowledge and experience that career is another thing. Uh, for me, uh, what came to mind for me was recently, we, again, um, Anna and I want to thank you for anybody that, that helped, um, you know, give us the gift of a date night to Zahav, a, a local restaurant, the, the gift card for that. And uh, that was so, so just special to us to be able to do that. And, you know, you hear about a, a restaurant like that in, in the city, somewhere that's rated high. It's, it's, it's somewhere everybody says you've got to try it. Um, you even, you go and look at the Google reviews. You look at the list of all the top places to eat. Uh, you go and, and it, that got me intrigued. And I heard about, uh, man, what the culture is like there, man, what the menu is like. I, I, I went and looked at the menu online before I went and I was like, I don't even know what half of these things are. And, you know, I, I, I think it's good, but I, I really have no idea. But nothing can ever, you know, substitute the, the feeling of actually walking into that restaurant to actually experience the culture and to sit down at, at, at the table to have the menu there and actually order. And, and so for Anna, I, it was such a fun experience because everything was new to us. And to be able to sit there and have them bring out three to four courses and, and for every bite that we took, it was, you know, looking at each other and being, you know, seeing the face of, of trying something new, the joy of, man, eating this thing that I, I didn't know what it was before, but we're, we're leaning in and hearing the description from the waiter or the waitress uh, just so we can, can know what we're about to taste. It was incredible. First plate they brought out was the hummus, and <laughs> that was uh, just something we uh, devoured. It was so good. And I think more than, more than a restaurant that we eat or food that we taste, 
uh, as we've kind of really talked about already this morning, is even more so our walk with God is something that we don't just have a, a knowledge about Him. We read His Word, and it, it, God moves and He speaks in this, but he, he longs for us to have an experience with Him, for us to, to not just know and, and memorize Bible verses, but to actually step into an intimate relationship with, with God Almighty, that He makes that available to us that he's not distant. We just celebrated Christmas. We celebrated this idea that God is with us, that he would send his son to enter into our world, to step into our shoes and to lay down his life. And now through his sacrifice, we have the opportunity to come to him, to call out to him, as we said this morning, in a primary way in which we get to experience and and grow in a relationship with God is through this idea of prayer through this gift of communicating with God. You see, I think we know that the Bible talks a lot about prayer. We could point to scriptures that that give examples of Jesus praying, going to the Father often. Uh, We might be able to quote some of those passages like the passage we're in today, Matthew 6. You see, that's amazing that that we know those things, but so much more we have the opportunity to live in that daily to step into a prayer life that that God uses to shape us. And there's a richness that I believe can be found that is cultivated over time and consistency and a depth with God that's promised that we can't find anywhere else but through a life of prayer. You see, what I've just been praying over and even convicted in my own life is I think far too often we've settled for a passive prayer life, for passivity and in our talking and communing with God that unfortunately too many times is our our prayer life is only initiated by external circumstances or by the the gatherings that we attend or uh, by uh, the the time that we sit down with someone else but I I, I just I'm longing for us to see this morning and be reminded that prayer is a place where God wants to meet you in the everyday moments of life It's also caused me to reflect on the struggle of prayer. Why is it? We know all these truths about the importance of it. We see the power of it. We've probably even experienced it at moments in our life. But why is it that we struggle to pray so often? I don't know, some ideas, some thoughts. First of all, that stands off the page to me is that we are so overly distracted. That we are uh, walking around with, for sure, the internet in our pocket with notifications constantly um, grabbing our attention with uh, I was I was just recently uh, I, I read the book book by Bob Iger who uh, was one of the CEOs of Disney and it just interesting hearing his story of of uh, the way that that company has grown and all of those things but one of the things that stood out was the recent switch to Disney plus uh, that that you could take all of the content that Disney's ever created and now it's available to me right on my phone in the Disney plus app I can go and I can watch any movie that they've ever put out. How distracted are we? Our schedules are full. We have so many things that grab for our attention, not just our phones, but in life, in our work, in our family life. And then on the other side of that, the struggle is that we oftentimes don't plan to pray. We don't step into uh, intentionality with it. And the things that we don't plan often don't happen. But then to even dig deeper, I think... uh, Maybe some of us today might say there's a fear of prayer that we don't want to be disappointed. That the things we've sung this morning, maybe we're fearful that they wouldn't be true. That the God we call out to would would hear us, would answer our prayers. Or, or maybe at times we feel a lack of response. Maybe we don't believe that prayer actually matters, that God's will is going to happen no matter what. I know we don't have time to dig into all those questions, but maybe consider, why is that a struggle for me, personally? The other last thought I had was, I think some of us do fear the silence. What does it look like? I've been reflecting on this in my own life. What does it look like when the music's stripped away? The service, the gathering with, uh, of, uh, of people together. What does it look like when it's just you and God together? Are we cultivating that? I think we're too addicted to the noise. But again, today, I just want us to think not not to feel guilty or not to feel bad about our prayer life, but to take a moment here, as Drew said, to have inventory 
and to remember that there's a gift in communicating with God our Father. And I think it's going to help just to, to maybe consider this morning the right motive for prayer. Why do we pray? I think the end of it, at the end of our, our prayer life and these disciplines as rhythms of faith is that we would know God, that we'd be shaped into his likeness, that we would pursue holiness because it's available to us through, through Christ. So if we were just to, to kind of briefly define prayer, and again, there's a lot of ways you could describe it. Simply put, prayer is communication with God. Talking with the God of the universe. This can be thanking Him. It can be praising Him. We could pray through song. We could express raw emotion before God with Him. It might be anger. It might be bitterness. It might be fears and doubts. We see songs of lament in the scripture where, where people are praying that what, truly what they're feeling before God Almighty. It could be asking for him to move in the life of a friend. It could be contending to God. Would you move in our city as we're going to do on January 13th? Would you bring salvation to those who are lost? It could be sitting in silence before him, listening to him in the stillness. You see, unlike a, a fancy restaurant that we might only attend if we ever get a gift card here and there. We have access to this relationship with God anytime, anywhere, about anything. See, I don't want us to, to feel like we've got to be a master at this prayer thing. Um, none of us will be a master. We're going to see that in the passage this morning. There's no perfect formula, but what we are gifted with is the Holy Spirit that's in us, helps us to, to pray even when we don't know what to say. And it's something that we grow as we practice, as we, as we uh, have patience and we work at it. We will spend our life deepening a prayer life with God Almighty. You see, I think the disciples, so to get to our passage this morning, the disciples grew up in uh, a, a religious uh, society that, that valued prayer, that prayed often. They would pray in the morning. They would pray, um, it, at lunch. They would pray in the evening. So it's not that the disciples were unfamiliar with prayer and the practice of it. But we see this moment in Luke 11 where, and in our passage in Matthew 6, where, where the disciples, they're looking at Jesus and they're looking at their prayer life. And they're saying, there's something different about the way Jesus prays. There's something different about the way he prioritizes communicating with God Almighty. There's something that we need to learn that he can teach us about this idea of prayer. You see, in all of the Gospels, when we see the disciples with Jesus, there's only one time we really see them ask him to te them to teach them something. And what they say is in Luke 1, 11, 1, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples, disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Let me start with prayer over our message this morning. God, the fact that we can, can cry out to you, that we can, because of the work of you sending Jesus, the Son, now the Holy Spirit is available to us. Your presence is always with us. And we have the ability just to always be before you. What was once impossible for us to enter into the Holy of Holies and the, and the innermost part of the temple is now available to us in, in this life of prayer and talking with you. We come before you as a loving Father. We know that you uh, desire what's best for us. Do you have all wisdom? Do you have everything that we need? So God, may you teach us to pray like the disciples longed for. May we in our hearts step into that this year and grow in communicating and, and developing in our relationship with you. You're so good and so faithful. In your name, amen. All right, well, let's read our passage, Matthew 6, 5 through 15. It says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray 
in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty praises as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many re words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy, your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This portion of scripture is set, um, is a set of teachings that Jesus gave a Sermon on the Mount. And, um, we see that Jesus expounds at length. If you go back and read the, the previous passages, chapter five into chapter six, we see that Jesus expounds on many aspects of, of faith and, and walking with God. Uh, but this particular set of verses is, is uh, highlighted as the Lord's Prayer. And, and Jesus expounds upon this idea of prayer at the request of the disciples. And I think um, just be, because this is such a familiar set of verses, just remind us, like, don't glaze over something that's familiar. I can do that all the time. Something that's familiar, I glaze over and I forget the depth of it. And I, that's all my heart is today is that we dive into the model that Jesus gives for prayer and, and see the richness of it. Maybe it's helpful as we step into this month of prayer moving forward. Uh, the first thing that I want to highlight for us is that prayer must be a priority. Prayer must be a priority. The first thing that we see in this whole dialogue uh, that happens as Jesus is finishing up in his own personal prayer time. It says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. Um, that Jesus prayed not as a one-time event, but so often. If you were to survey the Gospels, you would see that Jesus uh, lived a life of prayer. He would constantly be fighting for time with God, despite of the crowds around him. It might be waking up in the early of the morning. It might be finding a quiet spot, uh, going on a hike. But Jesus made time for time with God the Father. In his most uh, moments of greatest crisis, pressures, victories, he prayed. And uh, it, it wasn't that Jesus didn't have a lot going on. The first thing I talked about earlier was just like, we're distracted. Jesus, it's not like Jesus didn't have just all the time in the world. Like Jesus, his ministry was growing people. As we see throughout the gospels, there were people that in a crowd would, would reach out just to touch his garment. Like he was increasing in, um, in popularity and in fame. We see this in Luke chapter 5. It says, But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. And it says, But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. See, when Jesus' public life and fame increased, he continued to prioritize talking and aligning his heart with God. We've seen the life of Jesus in so many throughout Scripture is that as Drew mentioned earlier, praying is like breathing. Praying is like breathing. John uh, Onwucheka says, To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Breathing, as a metaphor for Christian prayer, captures so much of what prayer should be. It reminds us that prayer is something essential to our existence. It's necessary for everything that we do. It enables every activity. See, my mind goes to to Daniel earlier in the Old Testament, who was a, a man who, who walked with God. He pri prioritized his connection with God Almighty so much so that the king and, and, and those that uh, were, were following the king, they set a, a rule that, that you could pray to no one else but Nebuchadnezzar. And when they found Daniel uh, continuing, refusing to give up his prayer life to God three times a day, they put him in a den of lions. The consequences were great, but it says just David is non-negotiable for his prayer life. It's like he's saying, throw me to the lions before I will cease and talk with and, and, and grow in my relationship with God. See the New Testament, we see Paul uh, speak to the Colossian church. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. 
to the, the church of Thessalonica. He says, pray without ceasing. And in our passage that we just read, Jesus expects the disciples will pray. It wasn't if you pray. He says when you pray. And when you pray, you must be not be like the hypocrites. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And when you pray, do not heap up empty pray phrases. Pray then like this. See, I know these are strong statements. I'm not trying to like forcefully uh, convince you to begin praying or to do that because you you know we we all uh, might feel that struggle. But it's so important that, that we see that there's just such a priority that uh, that that we get to pray that it's a gift to us. John Mark Comer says, if you want to experience the life to the full of Jesus, His nonstop conscious enjoyment to, of God's presence in the world, all you have to do is adopt not only his theology and ethics, but his lifestyle, that we would, would practice our faith, that we're commanded to pray not for a drudgery, but for our benefit, that it's a, a get to, not a, not a got to, right? That's a grace and a privilege because we desperately need the presence of God. And in the end, we will become more like him. And so this first point, and as, as you enter the rest of your day and into your week, maybe take that moment of in inventory. What's your walk with Jesus look like right now? How's your communication with him been lately? Have you had moments where you've been able to set it aside and prioritize and make time with God? And if not, it's okay. He's available and ready to hear from you. What are you cultivating regularly and where does prayer line up on that list? I just want us to think about that. Uh, point number two, we see that prayer is God's pre is about God's presence. So we're moving through the Lord's prayer each line by line. And I'm going to, uh, just for sake of time, I'm going to move somewhat quickly here. But, uh, first, first point is our Father in heaven. We see that we connect with God relationally. You see, we notice that before there's any kind of petition, the prayer, um, you know, there was plenty that Jesus had on his plate. He doesn't begin with reading uh, a prayer list. He doesn't begin with asking for things or throwing up lofty words. We see that prayer was all about a relationship with God the Father. That it doesn't start with outcomes before it starts with presence. That it's not about a petition, but a person. That through prayer, we enter the presence of God in all of our life. At the beginning of this passage, Jesus described two ways that we shouldn't pray. Like he says, don't pray like this. The first one was, don't pray like the hypocrites. They stand on the corner and, and they're all about what other people um, think and see them do. They find satisfaction out of that. And Jesus is, Jesus is not saying don't pray with people. Like actually, that's really encouraged through scripture. That's what we're called to do as a church. But what he's saying is, is look at the motive of your heart. It's more important that you would close the door, that you would go into a closet and pray before God the Father, and, and that you would cultivate a personal relationship with Him rather than just caring about what other people think. Like, what does it look like when no one else is looking? The second, the second kind of group of people and, and the way God, uh, Jesus describes not to pray is like the Gentiles who just heap up these empty um, phrases before God. They, they lacked engagement. They lacked intentionality, they lacked honesty and, and praying with their heart. They forgot who they were praying to, that God was right there, ready to engage with them in, in relationship. And it's interesting that he says, God already knows what they need. He says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. See, there's this theological truth here about God, that, that God that we come before and pray is omniscient, that he's all-knowing. <laughs> that he knows our needs before we even speak them. And, and that might cause us to kind of pause there and be like, okay, then what is the point of even praying? If he already knows what I need, why do I need to come before him? And I, I think that is the beginning of, a, of really uh, the right question of beginning to ponder, man, what is the purpose of, of praying and communicating with God? And, and maybe we'll start to become to the outcome that praying that God designed it to be a place where, into, where we have intimacy with him that supersedes what we need. That there is a closeness that God intends us to experience through prayer that we'll miss if we make it all about what it accomplishes or, or what we get in the moment. You 
Prayer is that cultivating relationship with God through the deepest of ways. I think a, a relationship with God, uh, we can tell, is, is, is relational because he uses the word father. I think that a father, a good father, is a place where someone is for us. Someone loves us constantly, that, that it's the safest place we can be. And I, it reminded me of, uh, I, I can't Im- imagine how much joy God gets when we come before him in prayer and communication. It reminded me of my daughter's. Uh, when I am leaving the house, they will, um, I, the other day I said, hey girls, I'm headed out and going to work. And I hear Maggie upstairs playing with all of her new toys. They've got way too many from Christmas, from all the grandparents and everything. And I hear her in the midst of that, stop what she was doing and say, wait, wait. And I hear her, her footsteps run down the hall. I hear her come down the stairs. And by that time, Adeline has caught on. She turns from the snack that she's all in and she runs over as well with a big smile on her face. And they both come to give me a hug and a kiss and to say goodbye. And for me, that's the best part of my day. That it, it brings so much joy for them to stop what they're doing and to prioritize this relationship that we have together. And I couldn't help but think that it's got to be the way that God enjoys cultivating and growing a relationship with us when we call out to Him, when we run to Him, when we talk with Him. It's about a relationship with our good Father that gives all of Himself to us. See, it's not about the presence, but His presence alone. He's what we've always needed. So just take it even further, prayer is personal. It's not lofty and and away from us, but it's something in which we can give all of our heart. I don't have time, unfortunately, for uh, to go into all of the, the examples throughout Scripture, but there is a wide range of prayers that we can run to and learn from, especially in the book of Psalms, which is the, the, the prayer book of the Bible. We see, again, raw emotion, true, like, feelings that God welcomes us to bring before Him. You know, it's a scary thing to think about. God knows everything about me. But on the other side of that, it's so comforting that this God that's all-knowing, He knows all of my junk, all of my failure, all of my pain, but still longs to know me, invites me close. Psalm 63, David says, Oh God, you are my God. Listen to the heart in this prayer. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land and where is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. It's personal. We we can give all of our hearts. It's a relationship with God. Point number three, prayer opens our hearts to praise. He says, hallowed be your name. That we can think about when we pray, we can start with this adoration for that word hallowed means holy is your name. You're set apart. When we pray, we can think about all these names that we've memorized and thought about, but actually personalize them in a way that, that helps us interact with God. I think over uh, our, our Christmas series, we, we studied the names of Jesus prophesied in Isaiah. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Man, in prayer life, we can take one of those names and we can come before God and we can say, God, thank you for being mighty because right now I need your strength. See, we can internalize and personalize the names of God and worship Him and and adore Him for who He is. And there's so many ways in which we can do that. What's another name, anybody? Name of God. Call one out. Do I have one? Good Shepherd. Another one. I'm testing you guys this morning. One more name? Alpha and Omega. See, take those names of God. And if you're looking for something to pray this week, each day as we pray throughout the month, take one of those names and internalize and personalize. What does it mean that God is Alpha and Omega? What does it mean that He's always been and He always will be? How can that really comfort and and draw me close. 
take time to praise Him. Point number four, prayer reorients our perspective and our pursuits. As we come before Him in this prayer, we say, Your kingdom come, Your will be done. You see, we can pray His agenda first and spend time focusing on what God is focused on. That helps us, this type of prayer where we, we call out, God, would your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? It allows us to get out of our own little kingdom, to quit only thinking about, man, what is it that I'm trying to build and, and consider the greater partnership with God that we get to engage in what he's doing in the world. So we're going to do on prayer on the parkway, praying over our city. And the difficult prayer of may your will be done. That as we are wrestling with our desires, as we're wrestling with, with decisions to make, as we're wrestling with things that are unknown, it's to surrender before God to say, God, I, I, just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't want to face this, or I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be, but we can come before him and say, Man, would your will be done? Surrender with open hands. There's something that God is doing and transforming us in those moments. Where we pray these things before him. To move quickly here, uh, point number five, prayer creates trust in God's provision. And so as we, we start with adoration for God, we adore his name, we praise him, we know it's about a relationship as we enter in and we ask for his kingdom to come and his will be done. As we consider, uh, man, what is he doing in the world and how am I part of that? We can also know that God invites us to pray to him about anything. That in a way, those other prayers kind of check our heart. Are we really praying for things that we need or are we just praying for things that are selfish? But when we've done that work, we can truly say, give us this day our daily bread. We can depend on him for everything. Um, it was a reminder for me when I was with my dad this past week, I was able to join him in his work and drive around with him in his truck as he went and checked on some of his uh, job sites. And he's got uh, a generator at one of these job sites. And, and uh, we went and, and it's supposed to just be this thing that you only have to change the oil every now and then. And it's supposed to be pretty simple. We're just changing oil and it ended up being like the whole thing was throwing all these alerts. And it was like... Um, not working and, and where you, you know, when you have a problem and then you try to fix it and you have more problems. <laughs> well, that happened. And so we're sitting there trying to figure it out. Long story short, we, we find a fuse that is broken and we're like, maybe this will fix it. But you're also like, we're driving to the parts store kind of doubting. Um, and we took a moment and I just said, yeah, let's pray. And it seems so silly in a way that I was like, uh, that we like wanted to pray over that. But but that's the kind of way in which God invites us into like all of our moments we can pray before him. We would just say, God, would you fix this? Like, we don't know how to, how to fix this and it feels kind of over our heads. We need like a mechanic. Would you fix this? And God welcomes us to do that. And we got back. I went to the porta potty because I had to go to the bathroom. By the time I got back, <laughs> my dad is like, let's get out of here. It's fixed. He put the fuse in. It was working. And it was just like, I had no belief that it would be fixed like that. But it was just a blessing. We got back in the car and we're like, God, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us to come before you before, with these things, these simple things. And, and it, it just says in Luke 11, like, ask, seek, knock. God wants to, to, to have us come before him with everything. Number six, prayer draws us to repentance. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. See, prayer is a place where as we come before God, we can, as knowing that he's a loving father, knowing that he has given us forgiven through, uh, forgiveness through Jesus, that he extends that forgiveness to us, and that uh, we don't have to carry a weight and run from him. You know, I was reminded of Genesis, the first few chapters in the, in the Bible, where the, the Adam and Eve in the first sin, when they sinned against God, what did they do? They ran. What, what they'd always experienced with God was this, this uh, relationship in the coolness of the garden where they would talk with him constantly. They would be with him and, and he would be with them. And, and there was this moment where they sinned that broke that relationship. And God goes searching for them and he, and he asks, what, you know, where are you? You know, I think, and we still have that pattern in our life today where, where we commit sin uh, rebelling against God, we struggle with temptation, and instead of running to Him in prayer and, and communicating with Him and embracing His forgiveness, we carry this burden and this weight. 
Well, God's designed in prayer is for us to be able to bring those things before him and, and be forgiven completely and, and to be able to walk in peace. And, and, and that allows us to experience him in such a deep way. David prays in Psalm 51, a prayer of confession that I think we could all um, read and, and model whenever we are in these moments. He says, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. See, uh, we don't have time to read the whole prayer, but maybe read that this week. Psalm 51, he goes on from, he goes from this moment of confession to this moment of delight and worship and praise before God. Because what God does in, in these moments of prayer and, and we bring, bring ourselves before Him, we confess, um, man, the ways we haven't been faithful as He completely shapes us with His love in a way that allows us to also forgive other people. You see, when we uh, find ourselves often confessing and, and, and coming before God, we, it also removes us of our pride. It helps us to be cloaked in this humility and to be able to, uh, when someone else wrongs us or when we're just uh, not easily finding love for someone else, we, we are able to do that because God opens our hearts to those around us. Point number seven, prayer expresses our faith in God's power and protection. Last part of that verse, it says, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. See, we express our faith in God's power and protection in this type of prayer where we, uh, following Jesus is difficult and we're in uh, spiritual warfare constantly, whatever that might uh, come to mind for you. What's that temptation that, that constantly just continues to, uh, to, to come at your door? Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, the ways in which God uh, equips us in our spiritual battle. And I find it so interesting um, the way he describes it. It says in, in verse 12 through 13, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. You see, and he goes on to, to, to list out the armor of God that we're equipped with. But it's interesting at the end of that, in verse 17, 18, one of the things he says we need to enter into is prayer. That in the way we battle these things is to constantly be in communication with God. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So as we move through the Lord's Prayer, as we look at that last point, we see that, man, through prayer, we get to lean in to God's power for our day, to, to His strength in temptation, to His strength for the areas that we feel weak, that He calls us to pray so often in, in a way that allows us to stay alert, awake at His return. So the encouragement this morning, I know that's kind of like a fire hydrant. Uh, of information, of things to consider, of ways to pray. But I just wanted to give it an idea of how rich even praying the Lord's Prayer, uh, the ways in which we can come before God uh, and in the ways in which He shapes us in that. But the simple invitation this, this week and this month is to step into that, to start where you're at, that you might take this model this morning of the Lord's Prayer and you, you could move through that this week in, in adoration to God, praising His name taking time for confession, taking time to, to pray on behalf of others in supplication, and take time to be thankful for all that He's done. If you find yourself kind of, man, wanting some to step into this and consider things to try, uh, things I would encourage is, is have a certain time. Man, think about it today. What's that time in which you're going to enter into prayer with God, into reading His Word, um, and, and set, set the alarm because uh, the chaos of the day often takes over. I have a certain place. Uh, for me in college, it was the bleachers um, by, the, by the football field uh, near the dorms. I would always retreat to, to the bleachers. And, and uh, in the chaos of my family right now, it's just the, the couch downstairs. <laughs> but for you, what's that place where it's distraction-free? 
where you can set your mind on on God and in prayer. Uh, and then have a plan, be intentional about, um, you know, the things that you want to pray over each day. And then I would just say, be patient. It takes time. It might feel different one day than the other, but be patient, be consistent, uh, and root it in the word of God. Maybe take, take the Psalms, for example, and pray through them. There's some great resources in, in the back library back there, praying the word of God. You could use that. Um, and I think that'd be really helpful. Um, and then lastly, I would just say it, it, it often is helpful to have a journal. For me, there's been times where for me to write out my prayer to God, especially after reading God's word and, and to, to be able to see uh, from pen to paper what my thoughts are and what's going on in my heart. It's really transformative. So as Eric comes, he's just going to pray, um, play softly here for a moment. I want to give us time to, um, to ask God to uh, grow our heart for, for him through prayer, to engage with him. Um, and maybe for you this morning, just in this moment before we, we sing our final song, maybe it's praying one of these aspects of the Lord's Prayer, a prayer maybe that you haven't prayed in a while. Maybe it's a moment to confess, to ask for God's forgiveness. Maybe it's been a while since you've adored his name and given him praise. Take a moment to do that. Maybe it's uh, taking time to ask for his kingdom to be experienced here on earth as it is in heaven, in Philadelphia, in your home. So we do that. We're going to end in, in song here. Eric will lead us. Let me pray. God, I, I thank you that you invite us into a relationship that we get to um, experience in every moment. God, I thank you that you long for us to be in communion with you. That you've made it available to us. And God, that you shape us in our prayer life, both privately and together. I pray that you would um, help us not to, um, God, let excuses or our schedules cause us to, to just not pray at all. I pray that we would step into it, that we would prioritize it, and that we would find that you shape us in those moments. And God, I pray that we would bring our hearts truly to you, that whatever we're feeling, that we can trust as you are a good Father, that, that you invite us close, that you'll equip us for all that we need, that you'll provide us for our daily bread. We love you in your name. Amen. Thank you.